Amen. I'd like to make one more little uh, note. We have a young lady with us today that I absolutely love, Miss Lily. And uh, her and her mother attended here many years ago, and her mother passed away, and she moved with her father. Right there, this young lady has been such an incredible inspiration to me, and I want to tell you I thank her greatly for what she has meant to us and what she has meant to the Lord's work. Miss Lily, thank you for coming today. Appreciate it. I like to embarrass her like that because she only gets to come this way every, uh, I don't know, maybe twice a year. So uh, it's good, and I appreciate her family for bringing her, and I really appreciate them. All right. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 119. <clears throat> Psalm 119, uh, verses 76, 77. As you know, we've been preaching on proclaiming God's Word. That's been the goal. That's been what our theme has been for the year. Today, I'd like to preach on the fact that nothing comforts us like God's Word. And that's just a fact. I have to tell you that when I am down and out, it's God's Word that will bring me out of it faster than anything else. And, uh, and I want to share with you these two verses. And I only have two points today, so um, I may talk a long time about them, but I just want to share two ideas with you from this passage. He says, Let I pray thee, thy, mercy's kindness, thy merciful kindness be for, for my comfort, according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Have you ever found yourself in a position with God where it left you, <clears throat> let's say, less than comfortable? I mean very uncomfortable. Maybe sin has crept into your life. Maybe you've been riddled with guilt confusion, maybe discouragement, maybe you're unsure as to what God might do, but whatever the case, because of sin in your life or something that has taken place in your life, you feel incredibly uncomfortable with God. I have to tell you, I've been there plenty of times. I remember growing up, my dad was notorious for this, but when we would get in trouble, my dad he knew he had a little bit of an anger issue. He was quick to get angry, and so he just wouldn't punish us when he was angry. Instead, we would get angry with us, and he'd say, go to your room, and I'll deal with you later. Now, what that meant was, I have no idea when he's going to deal with this. It might be today. It might be a few days from now. And he would just walk and mope around the house, and when you were in his presence, he'd just walk past you, and it was like, man, this is really uncomfortable. We'd be sitting and watching a TV program, and I'd just like watch him out of the corner of my eye because at any moment he could just say, okay, today's the day. But you knew it was coming, and he didn't forget. And when that time come, then he would say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Sometimes we would get disciplined in a harsh way. Sometimes he would talk it out, and he would maybe give us some little task to do around the house or whatever, and we'd take care of that. But man, I'm telling you what, until he finally came to that place where he said, okay, today's the day. It was really uncomfortable being around him. And I think about that in my relationship with God, because there are times in my life where I feel like God kind of treats me that way. I know what his will is. I know what he wants me to do, but I've not been completely obedient. I've not been where God wants me to be. And I'm really uncomfortable every time I come to him in prayer. Every time I come to him in my Bible study, and I think, God, I know this is here, and God, I'm really uncomfortable about this because I don't know how you're going to deal with it, and I don't feel like you've dealt with it yet. I, I remember when God dealt with me regarding my preaching, my pastoring. God dealt with me for a long time, and I'll, I'll be truthful with you. I rebelled against it. I didn't want to do it. I'd watched my father. I'd watched my family. I knew how things uh, would turn out with that, and and. So I just kept getting busier in the Lord's work, thinking that that would <clears throat> suffice. So what I would do is I got caught up and I did bus ministry. I was a Sunday school director. I taught a Sunday school class. I was taking Bible classes. Um, I was attending college, actually, and I uh, was very active <clears throat> in our church's visitation efforts. And I thought, how could anybody this active in the Lord be out of God's will? But every time I went to the Lord in prayer and every time I went to the Lord in Bible study, I felt really uncomfortable. Because there was something in my life that I knew I needed to do and I was ignoring it. 
I was pushing it aside. And I felt really uncomfortable. Every prayer brought conviction. Every time I opened God's Word, it brought conviction. It seemed that every sermon the pastor preached was directed right at, my, right at me. He might as well have walked back there and put his arm around me and just talked to me like a friend because I knew it was all about me. The conviction was so great, and, and I knew what I needed to do. So I'm here to tell you today, if there's anything in your life that's making you feel really uncomfortable with God, whether it's sin, maybe it's indecision, maybe it's complacency, maybe you've just gotten to a place where you don't seem to care, maybe you're just caught up in the world, God's Word spells out clearly what needs to be done. And it's when I get into God's Word and I study it that I get the most conviction because I see in His Word what I need to do and how I need to draw close to Him. So the comfort we're speaking of today is not that comfort you find when you sit in Granny's lap. It's not the comfort you find when you've got your best friend, your dog, sitting next to you and you're just rubbing and petting on him. It's not that kind of comfort it's not when you're sitting and having a little me time in your recliner with a, you know, with a good book and a cup of coffee. It's finding that sweet fellowship with God that's lost. Amen. It's finding that sweet fellowship that for some reason you just can't seem to, to find when it comes to your time with God. And it causes a great deal of discomfort in your life when sin has brought you misery or when your complacency has brought you misery or when your indecision has brought you misery. Understand and know that God's Word is there so that you might be able to find the comfort that God desires for you to have. And it comes in finding first His mercy. And that's what I want to talk about first. Finding comfort in God's mercy. He tells us in verse 76, Let I pray thee thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. Mercy, actually just the fact that he uses the word mercy reveals the source of our discomfort. For him to be merciful, there has to be a problem in my life. So it reveals the fact that I'm calling out for God's mercy tells me that the problem of my discomfort is sin. There is something there that is not pleasing unto the Lord. There is something there that stands in the way of me finding that sweet fellowship with God. So when we look at this, the fact that He even calls upon mercy tells us that sin is the real issue. And so as we take a look at this, why, why else would the psalmist call out for mercy? unless he recognized that there was something in the way that God needed to show him that kind of mercy. He is experiencing not some physical illness. He didn't turn his ankle and he needs to be comforted. He didn't, he didn't get hurt. Somebody didn't hurt his feelings. He, none of those things happened. There is something going on inside. There is something that's hurting him on the inside that, calls him to, that causes him to call out unto God, God, give me your mercy. Now, we know what mercy is. Mercy is that idea of God not giving us what we really deserve. God, right now, I get it. I deserve hell. I deserve your wrath. I deserve whatever discipline you have to dish out. But God, I'm begging you for your mercy because there is something in my life that's creating a problem in regard to my fellowship with you. Why else would we cry out for mercy? It's extended to those who are clearly guilty and in need of some kind of an outpouring of God's forgiveness, uh, His kindness, His love, whatever the case may be, because we are unable to restore that fellowship all by ourselves. Here is a dilemma that I think we run into. We have this idea that, listen, if I'm uncomfortable with God or if I'm uncomfortable with God's people, we have this idea that we can fix it all by ourselves. I've got the answer. I can just get busy in the Lord's work. That's what I did. When God was dealing with me and calling me into the ministry, my idea was, listen, I can get busy in the Lord's work and just do a lot of other things and I can ignore that and pretend like that doesn't even exist and I'll just stay busy doing the Lord's work and, and man, God's got to be happy with that. Man, I, I, I can help grow this Sunday school class. I can be this Sunday school director and I can run the bus and I can sacrifice my time and my effort. God has to be pleased with those things. God's pleased 
when we're willing to do what he has called us to do. And that's where sweet fellowship is. The sweet fellowship comes when we say, God, whatever it is that's in my life that's standing in the way of what you would have me to do, God, I need you to forgive it. I need your mercy. I need God for you to be merciful to me. You know, mercy is extended only to those who recognize it, who recognize our guilt. We need to recognize our guilt and call out unto God. We're told in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit of God is referred to as our great comforter. Have you ever noticed this? Before, if the Holy Spirit of God is our great comforter, and, it is, and He is because the Bible says He is, but here is a point that I want to make. The Holy Spirit of God makes me more uncomfortable than comfortable. You ever notice that? The Holy Spirit of God convicts me. His Spirit, bearing witness with my spirit, convicting me of my sin. There is such a discomfort in that guilt and in that conviction that sometimes it just seems overwhelming. But in order to bring us to a place of complete and total comfort, there has to first be that discomfort. There has to be that place where we realize we need God and only God. And only God can fix this. I need to see that I am in need of Him. God, be merciful to me. You know, when God revealed to me my sin, and He does so, by the way, through His Word, the hearing of His Word, the doing of His Word, when He reveals that, I have to be honest with you, at first, I'm miserable. Because I realized, man, I can't believe I failed so greatly. I can't believe how horribly I have failed. And I get miserable. But you know that's natural because if you feel no remorse, no conviction of your sin, I'm not sure that's a good thing. In fact, I think it's a good indication when we're convicted of our sin that God's dealing with our life and that we recognize something that God is in my life and dealing with me. You know, upon hearing God's word at the age of 12 years old, a young boy sitting at Salem Baptist Church in Russell Springs, Kentucky, during a revival meeting that my dad was preaching, I was convicted of my sin, convicted of the sin that was in my life, and I believed and trusted Jesus Christ to be my only hope. Laid my life before him, believing that Jesus Christ had paid the penalty of my sin. And he said, well, as a young boy, did you really grasp all that? Probably not in its entirety. But I knew I was a sinner, and I grasped that. I knew if I died, I was going to hell. I got that part. And I'll tell you now, I knew, I knew that when Jesus died on the cross, I didn't understand everything there was to understand about it, but I knew that that was necessary for me to be saved. There was something about that that just seemed like the only hope that I had. And, it, and my dad shared with me, he said, Barry, you just, you just need to believe that Jesus died for your sins. And trust Him to save you and forgive you. I believed that and trusted that. Oh, since then I've learned a whole lot more about it. Yeah, since then I've learned all the big words. Since then I understand a lot more. But here's the thing, I knew enough. I knew enough to know that if I died like I was, I was going to hell. And the only hope that I had was in Jesus Christ. And I cried out to God to be merciful to me. Dear God... I need to be saved, and I trust Jesus to do that. And I think that that's our only hope, essentially asking God to be merciful to us. You know, in the parable that Jesus spoke about the Pharisee and the publican, publican's a tax collector. The two went down to the temple to pray, the Pharisee being a great religious leader. And he went down, he looks over at the publican, because quite frankly, the worst sinners in all the world, as far as they were concerned, was tax collectors. You and I might agree with that, amen? <laughs> and they looked at that and they thought, man, how can that guy come here and pray? And that Pharisee says, thank God I'm not like him. Oh, look at me, I'm such a great guy. Man, I'm religious, I serve God, I fast all the time, I pray and I do all the things, I've got the rules down, man, I've, I, observe, I observe every one of them, I'm that guy. Thank God I'm not like him. And then the public comes, and he sits afar off, he stands afar off. He doesn't even come close because he knows he's a sinner, and he knows he has no business being that close to the Lord. He gets it. And the publican standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful 
to me, a sinner. Luke 18, 14 tells us this. Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. He's saying the Pharisee wasn't justified. He saw only his good works. It was the publican that recognized the fact that he was a sinner. Folks, if you dis- have this discomfort with God, if, if there is a problem, if you feel this guilt, if you understand and know the conviction, if you recognize that God's dealing with your life, understand and know the only hope you have is God's mercy. You know why I know that? It's because the Bible tells me that. It tells them that very clearly in the passages we've already read. The mercy of God allowed this sinner to go home and rest in comfort knowing that he had been forgiven. You know, it's God's word that reveals the mercy that can only be found in him. He says, according to thy word. You know, in the days of the psalmist, he could have looked to a lot of bad resources. I mean, you, you get the idea sometimes. I think when we look at Israel of old, I think sometimes we get the idea is where else could they have turned? I mean, in all honesty, I mean, they were God's people. Um, they had the prophets all around them. They had the Levites. They had, for most part, you know, sometimes, depending on where they were and who they were, had good godly kings from time to time. So was, the nation as a whole were God's people. Where else would they turn? I got news for you. Israel found places to turn. Too often they turned to the false gods that were in the land around them. And so they could have turned to a god such as Moloch. One of the things that stands out about Moloch was that he was a god who accepted child sacrifices. Statue of him stood in the heart of Gehenna, which was a fire that burned outside the city with his arms stretched out wide. And they would take newborn children and bring them and lay them on his arms that they might just cook in the fires as a sacrifice unto this false god. And somehow, somewhere, they seemed to think that they could find comfort in that. That there's somehow that they would be pleasing unto their gods. There are many today that think that they're pleasing unto gods. By the way, even in their day, they had uh, such gods as Dagon, who was the fishhead god of the Philistines. The fishhead god of the Philistines, they had destroyed them time and time again. God had made a point of destroying the Philistine god so many different times just to let them know that, listen, he is no god. And yet they still would turn to that as a god. In our day, we have just very much of the same thing. Islamic God of Allah is not our God, just so you know. There are a lot of people who say, well, Allah is just the same God. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's a demanding God who is unmerciful, unforgiving, unloving. He is not God. And when we look to this, understand this. What kind of relief, what kind of comfort would you have to go to a God who would not even reveal himself? A God who demands for you to do something but does nothing of himself. You know, we think about that. So what makes your God any different? I'll tell you what makes my God different. Your God demands that you sacrifice yourself for him. Our God sacrificed himself for you. Big difference. So that you could be saved, so that you could have eternal life. His mercy is overwhelming. When we call out to, for mercy unto our God, we are actually calling out unto a God that, that is merciful and can extend His mercy. Maybe it's that cold and accept anything God of Hindus. By the way, I should say gods of Hinduism. You know, Hindus are deceiving people. Very often you'll see them say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll trust Jesus. It's real easy to get a Hindu to say, I trust Jesus. Did you know that? They don't have any problem saying that because they'll accept any and every God and they'll take your Jesus God and set him right up on the mantle with all their other gods. He's no better, no worse than any of the rest. They just want all of them so they can get the blessings of every one of them. Cold. Let's just love everybody. Let's just love everything. Let's just accept anything and everything. The coldness of the Hindus. How about the God of Jehovah's Witness? Again, not the same God. I know there's a lot of people that get mad at you when you start talking about that, but they are a people with promises of little hope. 
that rests solely in your works and what you can accomplish. I went to a funeral of a Jehovah's Witness, Debbie's aunt actually, and it was the coldest funeral I think I ever went to. In fact, at that funeral, there was zero hope at all. They talked about the fact that she was dead and she would not see any life for who knows how long and that she understood that, she lived her life in that. She has no hope of heaven because they are already the number called, called. And the only hope she had was possibly of being one that would roam the earth sometime or another. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, you guys are full of hope. <laughs> Man, I came out of that service thinking, how could you come out of that and know anything about mercy? Anything about forgiveness? Anything about love? Folks, we serve a merciful God. You know, even today, one might turn unto paganism. And, and you say, well, is paganism in the world today? Yes, yeah, Satanism is very well, very live. Wicca? So, oh, Wicca? Seriously, is that part of that? I don't know. I kind of like Wicca. No, yeah, you better not. It's all of Satan. It has nothing to do with God. That whole trusting in Mother Earth and Father Sky and crazy stuff. All of those things that God created. I think I'd rather serve the God that created it rather than the creation. Amen. Amen. Folks, understand and know that when we call out to God, according to His Word, we're going to call out to the one way, truth, and life, and that is Jesus Christ. And there is none other than Him. We're given true comfort in Scripture by looking solely to Jesus. You want to talk about comfort. I love Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 when it talks about comfort. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Yeah, Folks, that's the rest I want. That's the comfort I want. I want to find what we can only find in Jesus. So in all of our efforts to find comfort, rest, peace, whatever it might be, I got news for you. The Bible has the answer, and the answer is God's mercy. Come to Him. There has to be the extension of His mercy, and we find that right here in His Word. You're not going to find it apart from His Word. To me, folks, to say, I, I know Jesus Christ. I'm a believer. And never pick up his word. I'm going to make a pretty bold statement right now. If you want nothing to do with God's word, you want nothing to do with God. It's a bold statement, I know. But I'm here to tell you, if God's word is not a very big part of your life, you've set it aside and you never study it, you never read it, you never look at it, you only acknowledge it when you come to church on Sunday morning, you hear the pastor or the Sunday school teacher proclaim it, I'm going to tell you something, there is a problem. I'm going to tell you now, guys, your wife probably wouldn't think much of you if the only time she saw you was on the weekends and even then you didn't really listen to her. We need to spend some time in God's Word. We need to spend some time with God. So in all of our efforts to find that, we're going to find it only in His Word. Thank God for His mercy. You know, I, I remember when I was a kid, I say a kid, I was like 16, 17, right along in there. I got my very first speeding ticket. I, yes, your pastor has a speeding ticket. More than one, just so you know. But for the record, I was going 45 in a 25. Now keep in mind, doesn't seem like that big a deal. Just go pay your fine, right? Get three points on your license. No, I was in my probation period. When you're during that probation, probation period, you go to court. So I went 45 in a 25, and I have to go to court for this speeding ticket. I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> I was pretty uncomfortable. All during that time. And by the way, I don't know how they operate now, but during that time that uh, the cop actually took my license because I was on probation. My dad had to come and get me, all right? So they took my license with them. I, was, I didn't have a license at that point. I'm like, I don't even know what to do, all right? So I'm expecting that they're going to say, well, you know, you don't get your license until you're 18. You know, you messed up. That's what I'm expecting. I was really uncomfortable. So my dad went with me. We went down to the court. And here's the deal. I knew I was guilty. I, it was legit. 
I couldn't, there's nothing I could say to justify it. You know, there was a reason why I sped, but it wasn't justifiable. The guy in front of me was going extremely slow, and I decided to pass him at one point when I could, and I did. But you know what? The speed limit's a speed limit, right? So here I am. I'm at court, and this uh, judge laid into me pretty hard. We're sitting down waiting my turn, and man, he was beating everybody up. I'm like, it's a bad deal. It's a bad deal. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, please don't do me that way. Please be nice to me. Please be nice to me. So come my turn, called me up, and then called my dad up too because he's in charge of me, you know. And So we're up there, and, and this judge lights into me just like he had lit into everybody else. I, I felt like I was going to cry. I'll be honest. I was like, oh, man, this is awful. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. And, uh, and, and he says, what do you got to say for yourself? I said, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed of what I did. I broke the law. I was guilty. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, I shouldn't have done what I did. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm just ashamed. And the judge just sat there and stared at me for a while. And he goes, well, he says, here's what I'm going to do. He says, of all the people that have come up here today, you're the first one that seems to actually seem like you show any signs of guilt. He said, i got to tell you, I really respect that. He took my license, handed it to my dad, said, you give them back when you feel like the time is right. He suspended the whole thing, and all we paid was court cost. I thought, wow, mercy. That guy was merciful to me. I didn't deserve that. I was guilty. I didn't deserve that. And so what happens is, is I walk out of there from my first offense. He, and he did say that. He says, and, and I see that it is your first and only offense. He says, well, I walked out of there free to go drive again when my dad gave me my license eventually. With great mercy, this guy extended his hand to me. God does that. God does that. I was so uncomfortable. I was guilty. I knew I was guilty. When we stand before God, what we need to do is recognize our guilt. And we need to recognize our sins, confess them before God. We need to be willing to say, God... I can only find comfort in you when I'm willing to confess these sins, repent of these sins, and Lord God, come back to you and serve as you want me to serve in the way that you want me to serve. Lord, that's the only place we find comfort in the Lord. That's the only place we find comfort is when we're willing to come to Him and say, God, I'm so sorry. Now, that doesn't mean He's not going to discipline you. That doesn't mean nothing's going to happen. But I'm going to tell you to get it out before God. Man just brings out great comfort, recognizing our sin. God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's desire. By the way, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you this, that, that if God is dealing with your heart, dealing with your life, if you knew you died today, you'd go to hell, know that God doesn't want that to happen. God wants you to cry out unto Him. He wants you to repent. He wants to save you. He wants to give you eternal life. He is long-suffering. He's waiting, and He wants and desires to say, Yes, my son, you're forgiven. By the blood of my son, Jesus Christ, I forgive you. Mercy. That's what God wants to give. Second thing I want you to see in this message today is this. I want you to see the new life that we find in God's tender mercies. He says this in verse 77, Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. God's mercies, by the way, are tender. You say, what does that mean? Well, i got to tell you, there are times when I see mercy as being tender, and I also see times when it's pretty rough. I see times when mercy is really kind of tough to deal with. Why? I don't understand. Well, I'll give you some examples. I want God to deal with me with kindness. I don't want him to be rough-handed even though he's being merciful. There are times when, when God, even though he's being merciful, kind of disciplines pretty roughly. I'll give you an example, David and Bathsheba. All right? 
Now, he could have done a lot of terrible, horrible things to David and been justified in doing so. He could have, he could have really wreaked havoc in David's life. He did take his son, the one that Bathsheba was carrying. He did do that. He did actually cause some problems to take place within David's family. But in the midst of all of that, understand and know that he could have done far worse. He was merciful to David in what he did, but it was still rough. It was still difficult. It was still a tough situation for David to deal with. You read in Psalm 51 of him crying and weeping and, and begging for God's tender mercies. We see where he's, he's on his bed weeping and crying until the death of that child. He wants and desires for God to do something entirely different. But when God answers and when God does what he does, it's over. And David then can find mercy. Psalm 51.1 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercy. He says, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He clearly understood how horrible and how wicked his sins were. He got it. He realized that, listen, whatever God does, he fully deserved it. He gets it. But in the midst of all of that, he's saying, God, be merciful. But even in dealing with me mercifully, he said, do, it, do your mercy in a way that's also tender. Tender mercy. Be nice to me. Make it easier. You know, he talks about cleansing. Have you, ever, have you ever been in the garage or wherever the case may be? Maybe you're doing some work where you're staining and you get it on your hands. Man, that stuff doesn't want to come off. And sometimes, you know, even though you need to get it cleansed, you've got to get it off. Man, it, it requires some harsh chemicals at times to get it off, which sometimes will irritate your skin, make a rash or do whatever the case may be. Sometimes you'll scrub so hard that you'll blister, or you'll rub your hand raw. You know where I'm talking about. And there are times where it's just hard to get it off. But you can eventually get it off. But some things are a lot easier to get off than others, aren't they? And some of them doesn't cause that same roughness as the others do. You don't have to be as aggressive getting it off as you do in some cases. Understand that God's mercy is going to be a little different from time to time. I plead for God's tender mercy because there are times, even in His mercy, that it's kind of tough to bear. And I want to look at that and I want to say, God, I want your tender mercy. So the real idea here is that God extend His mercy in such a loving fashion as only God can do. Not that he'll overlook your sin. I'm not asking him to do that. He hates your sin, by the way. I, I don't want him to, to think that I'm asking that he just forgive for the sake of forgiveness. Because I've done something wonderful. I need to understand where that mercy extends from. And I get that it's a matter of trusting him and knowing the price that he paid so that he could extend that mercy and that love, and that forgiveness to me. And so as I look at that, I think about his long-suffering. You know, I've talked about that word a lot. Some people think long-suffering and patience is one and the same. It's not. Patience is just waiting, just waiting and, and trusting that God's going to come through with an answer. Long-suffering is waiting and trusting that God's going to come through with an answer. But at the same time, there is a degree of suffering that takes place in the midst of it. There's a hurt. There's pain. A good example would be the apostles waiting for God to deliver them, but yet at the same time they were beaten, they were stricken, they were jailed. That's long-suffering. Patience is just waiting for the Lord's return. We talk about God being long-suffering. There is a hurt, there is a grief that takes place apparently in the heart of God concerning those who have rejected Him in hopes that they'll come unto Him under repentance. It is a grief to God that the people that He created or not trusting Him. He wants and desires to be merciful, yet there are those who have not received that mercy, and He wants to extend it to them. He says, Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live. 
Notice Paul's instructions to Timothy over in 1 Timothy 1.16. He says, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Without the mercy of God, we would receive what we truly deserve, and that's hell. We get it, damnation, torment, whatever you want to call it. We would spend an eternity paying the penalty of our sin. Thank God for his mercy. You know, even the Old Testament teaches that there is life in the mercy of God. I have life, a fulfilled life. Proverbs 21, 21, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, righteousness, and honor. Now here's the last thing I want you to see is this. Mercy's new life should give us a delight in God's Word. It should cause us to love God's Word. He says, for thy law is my delight. God, what you have to say, man, means all the world to me because of your mercy. Because you have loved me beyond, beyond my understanding. Who am I to ever doubt you? Who am I to rebel against you? Who am I? If there is discomfort between God and I, if I find discomfort in my relationship with God, be it known, it is not because of God. It's because of me. And I find that comfort in coming to God and crying out for His mercy, and I find that mercy when I confess my sin before Him. It changes everything. It especially changes how I feel about God's Word and how important it becomes to me and how much I want to read it and study it and know it. You know, when I realized my sin and then saw God's mercy and forgiven me through His Son, Jesus Christ, it changed how I felt about God's Word. It became more important to me. I'll be honest, even at the point where I surrendered to the ministry, God's Word took on a whole new perspective for me. And I began to love it and cherish it. And I find that comfort in His Word. Today, there is mercy. God extends His mercy. I find that in God's Word. That's why I say there's no greater comfort than God's Word. Because it's there that I find His mercy. It's there that I find God's love. And how he's willing to forgive. Today, if you're uncomfortable in your relationship with God, you might be lost. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you realize, I'm bound for hell. If I died today, I'd be in hell. I'm here to tell you, your only hope is to find God's mercy. Confess your sins before him. Trust him to forgive you. In the blood of Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary was pay the penalty of your sin so that you could be set free. It's a matter of trusting that. Today, God's mercy. If you're here and you're a believer and you're out of the will of God, you're not where God would have you to be, there's some things missing in your life, I'm here to tell you, today is a good day. Say, God, forgive me. Amen. Forgive me. I need to get back to where I need to be. I need to repent of that. I need... I need to get it out of my life and I need to get back to where I'm serving you the way I should. Dear God, I need to get back to a place of comfort. Bow your heads with me if you would. Think about this for a moment. Are there decisions that need to be made in your life? Is there anything in your life that's keeping you from being comfortable with God? God's book says you can call out for His mercy. God, forgive me for my complacency. God, forgive me for my indecision. God, forgive me for the sin that's in my life. God, forgive me for not looking unto you for leadership, for guidance. Today would be a good day to find that comfort that God would have you to have. Dear Father, I pray that today you'll speak to our hearts and our lives Cause us to realize that our only hope is in you. Lord, I pray that today, both those who do not know you and those who do might search their hearts today and draw close to you and make the decisions that need to be made. Lord God, please, today, may we find comfort in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand.
as we sing happy